Hi there, my name is Joseph Cassidy and I'm a New Zealand for the same. I'm here today interviewing Annie Newman, who's trying to be president of the Students Association. Hi Annie. Hi. Why do you want to be president of the, president of the Students Association? Because I think we are really lucky to live here, um, but there is just more that we could do to make sure that every single student at this university makes the most out of their experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I feel really strongly about that because I have been so lucky as to have a really good four years here. In my first year, um, doing this and interviewing with you would have really freaked me out. <laughs> um, and you know, now this year I had a university core meeting yesterday and sat there and spoke in front of some pretty scary people. And I really do think that every single first year at this university should have the opportunity to go through that transformation. Mm -hmm. And I think that with the experience that I'm bringing to the role, I can, I'm the best choice to make sure that that can happen. Mm -hmm. What experience do you feel you have that would prepare you for your role as association president? Yeah. So, you know, I hate to just be the person that adds to people talking about loads and loads of experience, because <laughs> it's kind of a buzzword. But I do think what's really important is that I've been the Rector's Assessor for the last year and a half. Um, that means that I've worked with Catherine Styler, but most importantly, it means that I've sat on university court in my own right. Um, that's the body that makes every strategic decision for the university, makes every fiscal decision for the university. It's where projects go to get funded. And because I've sat there, I have relationships with the people on it. Um, I've been involved in decisions that we've already made, and I can start on day one knowing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been really involved in the union a lot of people know that I could lift off a huge list of committees <laughs> if you really want me to. What I think though is most important is that I've spent so much of my four years not in this building. Mm. Um, I've been on event committees like FS and on Under Canvas. I've done community service with the Fellowship of St. Andrews and with Girl Guiding Scotland. Um, I've been in musicals with the Just So Society and I edited The Stand before it was a tab. <laughs> um, you know, and all of those things I think will make sure that when I hopefully get into this building um, and if I'm given the opportunity to be president, I'll be able to represent everyone in this university and not not just the people that spend their time in the union. Mm. If you were if you had been president over the past year, what do you feel you could have done better than not necessarily just what Pat's done as president, but what you could have done more? I think something that the team two years ago, so that's you know, Pat Fay, Leon, Andre, should be really proud of is that I think they were very visible. Mm. Um, students knew who they were. They made time to go to first year halls, to, to talk to first years, to really go out into the community and leave this. I think um, not necessarily through fault of their own, but this year's SAB team as a whole has not been as visible. Mm -hmm. I think communication hasn't been there as much, and that's something that I'd be really keen to change and improve on. Um, I, I'm really talkative, I'm really wordy, and I really like meeting people. I'd be really excited to go out and do that. Mm -hmm. Do you think visibility would be the main thing you'd like to improve on as association president? Um, in terms of the entire SAB team, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of just as president, you know, there, if you think like you have a manifesto, I think it's less of an issue of improving and more of an issue of recognizing the things that we've done really well, recognizing mm -hmm. the things that will continue to go really well because we've put those processes in place, um, and allowing ourselves to shift our focus to some new and really exciting projects. Mm -hmm. This, uh, going on to something sort of like similar but also like different, <laughs> is uh, could you name me one good thing from the past year that you would like to see more of in your term as association president and one bad thing that you feel could have been improved on? Yeah. Good thing, I think. Um, and to be honest, this is aside from, you know, we all know the good things, like there has been an international hardship fund creative, created, I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. We just got an email this morning that said we're getting 900 new beds. I think that's incredible. Um, but to be honest, a thing that I think has went really well that is somewhat undernoticed is that we've made a union communications team. Mm -hmm. We have a group that I'm a part of. Um, it's a group of four of us that um, the current president chairs. And we sit down and look at how people actually communicate with the union, how people can best get the news, and how people can best be informed of these really good things that are happening, like the International Hardship Fund. Um, so that is something that I think I would be really excited to build on. Um, something that I think has gone less well, I think does go back to the visibility thing I mentioned. I think, um, again, it's the context of this year, you know, we've had to search for a new principal, we've had a lot of things going on that are really one-offs, but I think making time to go back into those first year halls, making time to really leave this building, um, and making sure that every student knows who we are mm -hmm. is really important. What would you feel sets you apart from any other candidate in like the race for association president? You know, I don't, I don't like to like spread buzzword, mm -hmm. um, but it does go back to the experience. I think I cannot emphasize enough how important the role as rector assessor will be for me if I mm -hmm. win this election. Um, 
it means that a lot of the projects that I've put forward, um, shifting our focus on accommodation and creating really like new things like internship schemes and online platforms and a new mental health policy, those things involve going into the university and working with people. It involves working with student services, with residential business services, and with the people on university court. I know I can do that. I've already done that. I've spoken to a lot of them about these policies and they're looking forward to, you know, knock on wood if I win, yeah. um, getting to help me out there. So I think that is the most important thing yeah. um, in this race. Okay, moving on to like the specific things within your manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things is obviously you spoke about accommodation in your manifesto, which is obviously the big yeah. issue. Students are always concerned about mm -hmm. accommodation. It's probably every association president spoke yeah. about it uh, every, uh, forever, yeah. probably. Forever. Um, so one of the things you specifically mentioned is you're, you're happy with the sort of progress we've made, the university's made this year in terms of expansion of halls and that kind of thing. One thing you'd like to see, you said, was expanding universities' uh, managed portfolio yep. of other house, of like the flats and the houses that it owns mm -hmm. around town. They often have cheaper rents and yep. better leases for students. Um, what, do you think that's a feasible thing to do? Absolutely. The first thing that I'll say though is that I wouldn't necessarily say um, I'm happy with the mm -hmm. kind of what we've done with our build-based strategy. Yeah. I think that we've done it and I think that that's incredible. I'm very happy with that. I think that there is always more to be done though in making sure that those leases are better it's more affordable mm -hmm. um, and particularly that students that are misplaced due to new builds find somewhere to go yeah. um, however back to my plan um, I really do think it's feasible we as I said this build based strategy presidents have been talking about it forever mm -hmm. like it has been a buzzword for so long and it's started to work what we now have the resources and the energy to do is really shift our focus mm -hmm. um, and I'm really confident that with the relationships that I already have and the knowledge I already have of how those things get implemented and the financial assets of the university mm -hmm. that I can really make it happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing you did speak about there was the idea of students being misplaced by some of the like, new mm -hmm. buildings happening. And obviously we just had the announcement this morning about the like, new expansion yeah. for all different halls. One of the things that happened there was that they announced that Albany Park will either be demolished or fully or partially demolished. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, Alley Park is the cheapest hall. It, it helps cater yeah. to students who may not afford in many other places mm -hmm. in town. I know, I know people stay there the full four years because obviously they can't even afford anywhere yeah. else in town. How would you, uh, how would you like look out for students who maybe can't afford most most mm -hmm. of the other places in town? Yeah. So I think in this specific situation, we need to make sure that there is bed space available um, for students that really can only afford Albany Park. But my widening access policy, I think, really does that. Mm -hmm. um, the cornerstone of that is something that I'm actually really excited about yeah. which is to combine accommodation bursary application in with university um, application which means that should someone apply from a low-income area um, they will not have to fill out a separate application form for an accommodation bursary mm -hmm. and when they get their offer of place for the university they will also get their bursary alongside of it mm -hmm. so they will know as soon as they come in that they have a scholarship to help pay for the cost of living it will reduce the anxiety that inevitably comes with attending St Andrews and being like where do I live mm -hmm. um, and specifically in this context I think it will really help with the misplacement of students mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that is also a very reasonable idea, the idea of you know, combining the two mm -hmm. and making sure students are picking up on anything that they are eligible for. Yeah. But do you, think, um, do you think that's the main problem? Do you think that is a problem that people have faced? Have people not been taking up accommodation bursaries? Because surely people who uh, need these bursaries mm -hmm. would look out for anything that they can. Yeah, so they absolutely do. And accommodation bursaries, every single time we've increased them, which we've done over the last two years, has gotten a huge uptake. Yeah. Um, I think what this policy is trying to do is A, show that we care about these students that mm -hmm. are taking them. Um, we want them to come to St. Andrews. We are not saying fill out another application if you want to. We genuinely want them here. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is that I really think that it has the possibility to improve our reputation in these low-income areas and low-income schools mm -hmm. at the ground level. You know, we know sitting here that we do not have the best reputation as a university in some parts of Glasgow and some parts of Aberdeen. Yeah. Um, when one student, I think, gets their offer of place alongside their accommodation scholarship, when they, as you know, a couple of my other policies, when they their, their transport to open days gets paid for, mm -hmm. when they know that they'll have a subsidized textbook, mm -hmm. that information ripples and it changes our reputation in those schools mm -hmm. and over time it does make more of those widely access students want to mm -hmm. come here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you spoke about a thing, uh, obviously this is dealing a lot with the idea of getting more students to uptake on these mm -hmm. uh, and, and like take the bursaries that they can't, they are eligible for, but do you think do you not think that more funds is the main problem? Students are, there are more students who, if we had a bit more funds for more bursaries, mm -hmm. more students from lower income backgrounds could come to St Andrews? I think that's definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that 
you know, we've seen it. We've increased the accommodation bursary funds over the last two years. That's certainly not something that I'd stop pushing for by any stretch. But what I do think we can say is that we've seen that be a success, but we do have this fundamental reputational mm -hmm. problem. You know, we increase the fund short. People still don't necessarily want to come here. They get the wrong mm -hmm. idea of what this place is about. And sitting here, you and I know how special it is. Mm -hmm. um, what these three policies, I think, are really doing are showing kids how mm -hmm. special it is and saying that we want you to come here and experience it with us. And that's why it's really important to me. So you would say, you say as president, dealing with the reputation of St Andrews and Scotland and possibly in the whole of the UK, is one, would one, be one of your priorities? Oh, oh yeah, of course. Um, you know, alongside everything else that I've laid out, I think that our reputation in these lower income areas is a pretty big barrier in getting students to come here. And it's something that is, a fi is, is fixable mm -hmm. and can be done with these kind of no-nonsense solutions. Mm -hmm. So it's something I'd really like to see play out. Mm -hmm. uh, getting back to sort of the idea of specific things you said to do about wedding access, one of the things you mentioned in your manifesto is this idea of subsidizing textbooks, because mm -hmm. obviously they're a big cost to a lot of students, yeah. especially if you're from a low income background. Where would the money for that come from? So I think we work with the ambassador scheme who, so the ambassadors, um, I believe starting this year, have already um, started forming a support system for widening access students that are already here. Mm -hmm. I think we work with them and we show the success stories that they've had through their mentoring program. We speak to students that, that could have used and that's the stuff that we use when we go to University Corps and we lobby for this money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it goes back to the experience thing. I think as rector assessor, I'm in the best place to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm pretty confident on it. Yeah, you've spoken, you've spoken a lot about your experience as rector's assessor mm -hmm. and through other things in university. One of the, and obviously one of the other roles you did was member for gender equality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the SRC. Now, we received like an honest tip from someone who uh, 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 in the university who, regarding the SRC meeting that took place over the issue of SRC reform. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously that was quite controversial at the yes, time. Yes, it was. Well, uh, to obviously p to anyone who's watching to remind people, it was the idea of getting rid of all the members for to, for the uh, for various like gender equality, uh, LGBT, that they would be represented by the Equal Opportunities Office. Can I, can I maybe clarify that and say that it wasn't mm -hmm. getting rid of them. Oh, yeah, no, it yeah, was, yeah. however, yes. moving those positions um, mm -hmm. off the SRC, keeping them in place, um, and strengthening yeah. the Equal Opportunities Committee that they were already on. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. And obviously, yeah, and obviously there was quite a lively debate at the, at the, at the SRC and um, you, you eventually, even though you were the star of it, you then took the concerns forward and um, you voted against the uh, vote. I didn't vote. Um, I don't, as rector's assessor, oh, I don't yes. get the vote. Um, mm. The other person that put forward with me did vote against mm -hmm. it though. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, as rector's assessor, I get to argue a lot. Um, <laughs> because I'm unelected, I don't get a vote on the SRC. But yeah, well, the one thing that the, the person uh, pointed out to us was during the, during the meeting, you said in regards to sort of arguing your point that uh, people shouldn't, like sort of, for the SRC reform, mm -hmm. you said when you were a member for gender equality, that you, outside of the SRC, you did nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, yeah. So I guess our question is, if like, shouldn't you have like gone and tried to yeah. find things to do? To be honest, I think um, me saying that was me really trying to fight for this mm -hmm. motion that I put forward. Um, I don't think I gave myself enough credit, if I'm really honest with you. So when I was a member for gender equality, um, one of the things that I ran on was increasing events with individual schools, bringing back female alumni that mm -hmm. work with those schools um, to give employability talks. Mm -hmm. That's something I did with the Women in Academia conference that I worked with the current, or the last DOREP and the last um, Science and Medical no, Arts and Divinity faculty president on. Mm -hmm. It was really successful. Um, another thing that I did that I was really proud of was take the zero tolerance policy forward from a poorly edited um, kind of one page document and make sure that security staff was briefed on it, make sure that it was fully publicized around the union because I was coming into this role and as soon as I came in, there was a series of sexual assaults, if we all remember correctly. Um, so I think SRC reform wise, um, I'm happy to talk about that further, but in the, con in the context of that discussion, I think that I was really fighting for something and perhaps not giving myself enough credit for all the work that I did two years ago mm -hmm. because I really believe that my time there was pretty strong. So yeah, we'll talk about a bit about SRC reform because obviously it was quite controversial and you led along with Charlotte Andrews, mm -hmm. the alumni officer. Uh, if you just want to sort of give a brief explanation of yeah. why you put forward these proposals that some mm -hmm. considered, you know, uh, that were offensive and not really in keeping with like the university's, you know, ethos. Yeah, so we, um, SRC reform, as really lame as it sounds, mm -hmm. is something that I actually care a lot about. Mm -hmm. I've sat on the SRC for the last two years as member for gender equality and now as rector assessor. Um, 
And there is a really large consensus that it does not work as a body. Everyone that sits there has jobs outside of the SRC. They do those jobs very well, actually. The SRC itself, however, it really doesn't function. Debates last either too long or lo not long enough. We don't debate the right things. Um, and that's something that we took a lot of time and made sure all of us agreed with. Mm -hmm. um, and that was me, Charlotte, and Zara Evans, the association chair, working on it together. Um, we passed two phases of reform before that went through absolutely unanimously. It was the third one that, as usual, um, became quite controversial. So as I said before, what we tried to do was take the member four positions that sat on the SRC and also the Equal Opportunities Committee um, and make them sit uh, move the position from the SRC to a very strengthened Equal Opportunities Committee. The Equal Opportunities Committee of the SRC is the only committee that functioned like that. Mm -hmm. Everyone else did have one, but they didn't sit on the SRC. Mm -hmm. So we did that speaking with those member four positions, and you know we talked to them about what did it feel like to go to two meetings um, a week that they kind of did say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, what felt like they could get changed out of their role. Um, and we really thought that a smaller SRC would do significantly better by students. Mm -hmm. This was an idea we put forward. I put it forward because I thought it was the right thing to do at mm -hmm. the time. And the cons, the people that disagreed, had incredible points. Really, really good. I think the strongest being that um, it was a lot to ask of the Equal Opportunities Officer. I really fundamentally disagree, though, and I think a lot of other people would as well, that removing these member four positions, however, um, was meant to take away minority groups' representation. Mm -hmm. I was member for gender equality. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it was voted down, absolutely fine. I unfortunately cannot vote, mm -hmm. um, but it was voted down. What I'd like to take away from it, though, is that I think it's really important, and I'm not the only one that thinks it's really mm -hmm. important. And should I win next year, I'd really like to take another look at SRC reform a, from a completely different way. We've shown that this one doesn't work. But I want to get constructive ideas from different people, from the people that oppose this and from the people that were for it, because it is too important to let it lie year after year. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, so, do you, so you, and future SRC reform, uh, like you said, you would like to pursue as, as president. Mm. Would you still look at maybe removing some of the members from the SRC or rebuilding or restructuring the, the SRC in SRC? I think everything would be on the table. Mm -hmm. um, and as it was last time, it would be a very collaborative process. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, removing every member for position um, was not very popular. Yeah. However, at an SRC meeting prior to, or sorry, following that, we ended up removing member for international students because yeah. we realized that the remit of that position was very similar to the remit of member for racial equality. Mm -hmm. um, it's little fixes like that that I think can continue. We can try and do it in a big overhaul. We can try and do it little by little. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the decisions that I'd like to make with people around me that care about it just as much as I do. Yeah, so you're emphasizing the idea of a collaborative process. Absolutely. Uh, and um, in and, and the meeting, there was, so there was because uh, I was there mm -hmm. voting on it, and there was there were some people who said that they felt that things like this, things like SRC reform, were often pushed through behind the scenes. I think um, I think yeah, there were some people who seemed uh, almost upset at the idea that they hadn't been consulted. Mm -hmm. They felt they hadn't been. I mean, obviously you said you did try to consult, did, them, yeah. but there are some people that say that they didn't feel they were consulted enough, mm -hmm. or they didn't feel that um, there was a wide enough right. know, discussion of it. Do you feel, and they said part of that was because there was this, uh, and there was sort of a small group of people pushing things through mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Do, and obviously this goes back to the idea of people, you know, everyone thinks, you know, there are certain union people yeah. who do everything all the time. And you've always spoken quite a bit about your experience. You think in that sense that your experience could be possibly a disadvantage because you sort of been in the union a lot and you maybe... Yeah, I will. So I really don't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that because I think my experience in the union, um, I'm SRC senior officer and I'm also trustee of the association. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff means that I can operate within the union. Mm -hmm. What I think will make me a better candidate than people that maybe have really only lived in the union for these four years is my experience outside of it. Mm -hmm. Like it's planning events and it's doing these community service opportunities, writing for a newspaper mm -hmm. um, and like performing in musicals, which is such a funny and silly thing to do. That's I think is what makes a really well-rounded individual. That's what makes someone really good at this job, I mm -hmm. think. Um, it's that experience that I think I will draw on really, really heavily to make sure that that point of view isn't clouded just because mm -hmm. I would have an office in this building should I win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving on to another topic in your manifesto, uh, which is the topic of mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in mental health, uh, you, one of the things you propose is bringing a clinical professional mm -hmm. to work at the university to help support yeah. students. Uh, do you think this would be enough to help support students who are struggling with mental health? Please? So I'm actually really glad you asked that. Um, 
one of the things that I'm really excited about with this policy, um, because it's something I care a lot about, is that I think we all know that the Director of Representation's remit is on mental health strategy in the association. We have, however, have not had a president that has looked at what they can do for mental health, from, for mental health from an external relations standpoint, and that's what this is. So for this, I'm looking at what can we do with it with the university and the government. I'd like to bring in this clinical professional um, to really support the students with the most severe mental illness, work between their counselor at Student Services and navigate the NHS, which is where their treatment and their diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, like, this affects almost all of us. I'd be hesitant to say there's a student here that isn't affected by, by issues of mental health or doesn't know someone that is. Mm -hmm. I think by having two SABs on it, it will make so much more of a difference to the lives of these students that are affected. And I am really excited to try and work on it from these two different points mm -hmm. of views, and I don't think that's been done mm -hmm. before. Yeah, you're obviously speaking about working out from two different points of views, mm -hmm. and obviously like, the director of organization does a lot to cover Absolutely. mental health, that's like, their remit within the student association. Do you think the university itself, though, do you think they're doing enough to help people with mental health difficulties? I think this is what, um, this covers a gap that I think everyone recognizes that we need. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it will really do a lot of good for the people in that small minority that do suffer from pretty severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, we live in Fife and mental health with the NHS in Fife is not great. Mm -hmm. um, that has nothing to do with the university being here, that's just life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think putting this policy forward means that we will be able to respond to that in a much better way with the engagement of the Student Association. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the idea of bringing a clinical professional to help students' mental mm -hmm. uh, issues. Is there anything else you think the university could specifically be doing to help students' with mental difficulties? I think this is what I'd like to tackle first. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a really good project to um, go in, implement, and then assess how it's doing afterwards. Yeah. See how we can optimize it, see if there's things we can add to it. But I think that this is a really good starting step in terms of um, university mental health policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the next point in your manifesto you went through is the idea of expanding uh, our associations with alumni yes. and uh, through, throughout the university. So obviously this is a big, this is a big thing by Pat Martin, mm -hmm. president, and, we've, and the, we've had the alumni weekend mm -hmm. and we've had various other efforts to reach out to uh, alumni and help them connect with students here. And obviously you spoke about expanding it. So if you want to just give a brief rundown yeah. of what your plans are for alumni. Definitely. Um, so I think the Alumni Festival weekend, this is going to be its second year. Um, I think it is an incredible opportunity. I think that because it is so new, we are not making the most of it yet. Mm -hmm. And there are lessons to be learned from how it's gone in the past, from new ideas, um, from new collaborations that can really make it more successful in the future. Mm -hmm. So I have two specific plans for that. The first is to bring in a, a very centerpiece dinner um, as part of the Alumni Festival weekend. Mm -hmm. Right now, we put a lot of responsibility on societies and on sports clubs to run their own events, publicize them, and bring their own alumni back. I don't think that's very fair um, and I also don't think it means that it is effective as it could be. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good first start but now we can take it further. So putting in the centerpiece dinner means that students that do not have a connection to a club, to a society, um, to anything mm -hmm. can come back, have a reason to come back with their pals because mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. Um, the second thing that I'd like to do with the Alumni Weekend is make it a little bit more visible to current students. Mm -hmm. I think we don't know what our alumni community looks like mm -hmm. and that's a shame. Mm -hmm. So to do that, I'd like to have an alumni careers fair. Um, so we get alumni when they come back, I think specifically more new alumni would be really keen on this, um, to tell us about what they're doing, to give them presentation on the careers they're in, how they got there and how St. Andrews helped them get there. Um, that means not only will students have opportunities opportunities to network, further their career opportunities, um, but also to see what they should be excited to join and to mm -hmm. see what there is to offer them. So. Mm -hmm. okay, uh one of, the, one of the other things you spoke about in your manifesto is this, uh, the idea of um, relations between government and the university. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you spoke about is establishing a service whereby students can uh, easily give their opinions yes. on things like uh, you cited the examples in the manifesto of things like the Save the Rector petition. You also spoke about the Prevent... Um, the the £35,000... The, the 35, yeah, the £35,000 yeah. £35, uh, immigration issue. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, one, I guess one, one of the things I'm going to ask there is St Andrews obviously has this image, both out with and within the university, of we're not very politically engaged. Mm -hmm. where we don't really have you know massive protests like other universities. We don't have a lot of political yep. groups or societies are not the most active. Do you feel that like, students would be they would use something like this? I do, and I think we see the uptake in the uproar about the thirty-five thousand um, minimum salary for international students to get a tier two visa, mm -hmm. and the success of the Save the Rector petition as two examples of why it would work. Mm -hmm. What I like about this. Um, 
specifically because you mentioned the fact that we are like not as political as others may be. Mm-hmm. Um, what I like about this is that it makes it personal. It doesn't make it political. Mm-hmm. It's an opportunity for students to share their story and to say, you know, I have a job and I'm not going to be able to take it now because there's this cap and that affects me in this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and to give those verbatims directly to the government and directly to the student association mm-hmm. to use. Um, when these bills come through, they're given any anyone that's interested really, and particularly higher education institutions, mm-hmm. are given the opportunity to write a response to it, which mm-hmm. the student association does usually take up. Um, what this means is that in that response, we will include an appendix of exactly why this will affect students. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I really like it. I think it's not a riot, but it's an effective way to really communicate that um, in a way that's personal and really means something to the students that are doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think, under your presidency of the St. Andrews Student Association, do you think the Student Association will become like, more activist, more involved in sort of saying saying to the government, no, the students of St. Andrews condemn this measure or things like that? I think activist would be the wrong word to use. What I think I would really want to do is make sure that the Student Association has mechanisms for students to communicate with them if they see fit, like this portal. Um, I think by doing that, it means that like, Students can riot in the streets if they want to, and they should have every right to do it. We even have an external campaign fund that you can apply for and get um, if you want to buy signs. Um, what I want this to be able to do is to make it more human, um, to give them a mechanism to say, yes, I'm upset about it, but here's why. And I think that that leads to a less activist stance, but a more like personal and very like sympathetic and real stance that the Student Association can take. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah, going back to sort of the idea of the wider idea of students not being maybe as politically involved as maybe they should be or mm-hmm. could be. Do you think that, like more could be done for students to get involved in like poli- like uh, sort of national political issues that do affect them? I think that's exactly what I'm trying to do mm-hmm. um, is give them a real mouth point, uh, mouthpiece to the association, to the university and to the government itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really excited because I think that that will get uptake from mm-hmm. students that are really interested. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I, a few SRC meetings ago, I'm sure you were there, we set up a 500 pound external campaign fund for any student mm-hmm. that wants to come in and use it to mm-hmm. go to a protest, to start a protest, to buy a banner, mm-hmm. do whatever you want to do. Um, so I think that these things are really good first steps and next year, should I be president, we look at the uptake, mm-hmm. we see if it's being used, we see if we need more money, less money, mm-hmm. and how it works, and we optimize and change from there. You spoke a lot about like giving students the tools to do this mm-hmm. themselves and go out and you know start a protest if they want. But like um, one of the things that's sort of different about the St. Andrews Student Association from other students, because a lot of other student association take explicit political positions on issues. Yes. They'll take, they'll do they'll do explicit campaigns, they'll get he- very heavily involved, they'll their president and other sabbatical officers will get heavily involved themselves. Is that not the kind of thing you'd like to see under in St. Andrews? I think the reason and one of the really good results of why we are different from that can be seen in our elections turnout. We consistently get at almost or a little bit above 50% of students voting in our elections. Mm-hmm. That means that 50% of students are engaged in the student association. And if we took really um, intense and very right or left wing or centrist um, political views, we would, we would be alienating those students. The purpose of this building and the purpose of the student association is to, make, is to give students the opportunities to make the most of their experience mm-hmm. here. We want to do that for every student, whether mm-hmm. they want to campaign for something on the left, on the right, not at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why we're really, su- we're really successful and I think that's why we're really special. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I'd really like to see keep going. Mm-hmm. Uh, so going back to sort of this uh, wider idea of things that student association does on a national level, mm-hmm. um, Earlier this year, we had the aborted NUS referendum, yes. which obviously you were involved in. You were the leader of the No campaign yep. to not join the NUS and, uh, until it was cancelled, obviously. Yeah. Uh, one of the things sort of the yes side cited is that St Andrews isn't really involved with other student association, student, uh, students associations as it could be. Um, do you, think, do you think we could be more involved with other students? I absolutely do. Um, I think we have good relationships right now with Glasgow. Um, we're working on them in Edinburgh. As rector of the semester, something that I've worked really hard at is our relationship with the Edinburgh rector. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something I hope to really parlay into a good relationship with their student association, mm-hmm. especially considering they are a part of the NUS. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's things like this digital platform policy, um, I don't mean to keep harking back to it, mm-hmm. but having those verbatims I think are so important because it means that we have real legs to stand on when we are reaching out to these other student associations and saying, our students feel this way, do yours, mm-hmm. and if so, like, let's team up. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. By no means should we or do we want to be isolationist mm-hmm. in any sense. Um, However, I think there are better ways for St. Andrews to really stand with other student associations and have as big a voice as possible that do not involve joining the NUS. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, one of the other things, obviously you've spoken quite a bit about, and I referenced it earlier, the idea of individual students being able to go out and do their own thing and mm -hmm. uh, campaign on issues that they want to campaign on. But in regards to the NUS and the NUS referendum, um, one of the things like when the Yes campaign was speaking to me, what they said was that when they as individuals went to work on campaigns with other people from other universities or on a certain issues mm -hmm. or on various different things, one of the things they found was they said it was more difficult for them because the Andrew wasn't part of the NUS. Do you think it's fair or do you think? Um, I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I think my first response to that would be to go back to what we were talking about quite early on in this interview and talk about our reputation amongst mm -hmm. a lot of different areas. Um, by instituting widening access policies and by being more public about how we support our students here, about the external campaigns fund that we already have, about mechanisms for students to get involved in the government, that's how we change our reputation. Mm -hmm. We do it by doing the things that we know are right for us, believing in them and standing mm -hmm. strong by them. Um, I think if we do that, we've started doing that, we are doing that, and when we continue, um, students will be able to uh, protest, debate, whatever they like. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't want to see us become like say like uh, for a university and say SOAS, which is quite an active student association. They do a lot of uh, campaigning to do with. Uh, I mean, uh, if student like if students wanted to, if students really wanted a very political, very intense student association. Mm -hmm. Um, then fine. Mm -hmm. And if students really want like a very political, very intense student association, that's what they'll vote for. Mm -hmm. They've not voted for that mm -hmm. in a very long time, um, and that's what I've laid out in my manifesto um, gives students that want to be activists and want to protest anything that they want mm -hmm. the opportunity to do so and the way to do that in the way that I think would be the most effective for them mm -hmm. and for St. Andrews as a whole. But it also has so many different policies and programs for students that don't and that's why I really believe in it. We've gone through sort of most of the points in your manifesto and most of the sort of areas in it. But is there anything you feel that I haven't mentioned or asked you about that you would like to mention that like students know about? Yeah. Um, let's see, we did accommodation, alumni, widening access. Um, mental health, oh, internship scheme, mm -hmm. um, which is something that I wrote about in my manifesto and that I'm really excited about. So one of the things that I've definitely found over my last four years is that you know, we live on the edge of a cliff and it's amazing and it's beautiful, but it does make the hunt for internships and the quest to send off CVs and cover letters and applications, it feels a little futile because it feels like we're away from the action. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is bring those internships and work experience to St. Andrews and make them available exclusively to St. Andrews students. Mm -hmm. We have a global community and a global network of alumni, of advocates, of people that care about this university and would be happy to donate resources in the form of internships and work experience. What I'd like to do is start an outreach effort to those people to bring back those resources, make them exclusive to St. Andrews students, and put them in a very easy to use database that's available to everyone here um, that everyone can use mm -hmm. to apply for. Um, the Career Center, I've spoken to them about this. It's something that they'd be really excited mm -hmm. about. They already have some internships like that. They do have some work experience as well. Um, that's not very well publicized. We'd envelope that into this new user-friendly database mm -hmm. um, and make sure that the internships that we're getting that are exclusive to St. Andrews students get applications. And that way we can have them year in on year in and have every student get the chance to have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously the idea of loads, of loads of new internships that are exclusive to St. Andrews students from alumni all around the world, the people who are like involved and care about the university, it all sounds really, really yes. good. But do you think it's feasible to implement? I really do. Um, so as Rector's Assessor, I'm the chairman of the Rector's Fund, which is a scholarship body designed to give students um, 500 pounds mm -hmm. to pursue career opportunities, usually through internships. Um, I fundraised for that since I've become Rector's Assessor a year and a half ago relatively successfully. Last year we, get, we raised the most money that we ever have. Um, and one of the things that I've really gotten through talking to these people that are donating money and that are listening to me speak mm -hmm. is that they are more than happy to donate opportunities and they are more than happy to donate internships, things that don't necessarily cost money for them to mm -hmm. give but would genuinely make an impact in the life of a student. So that would be my first place to go look um, for these things and I think it's something that I have a good relationship with them and they will help me expand on it. But I do, I really think it's feasible and if I didn't I wouldn't have written it down. <laughs> okay, so. At the end of your time as association president, what would you like to be your legacy in the university and in the student association? To be honest, I don't mind so much. Mm -hmm. A legacy, um, what people remember, you know, hopefully, should I win, remember me for, um, I don't mind. What I want to do is get through these things that I've laid out. What I want to do is start these paths to success, to change, to A, like implement new programs that I think we can do within a year, that we can do um, with very little capital investment, but that we can get done and will help students. Um, and B, to really start laying the groundwork for new strategies so that students now and in the future will see them. When I made these and when I wrote them, I was not concerned about legacy. Um, 
what I was concerned about is helping the students that are already here and the students that are going to come here in future years. Mm -hmm. So that's really my focus on it. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the students at St Andrews about why they should vote for you as association president? You know, I've said a lot. I've said a lot about my policies and I've said a lot about my experience. I think all of those things are true and I think all of those things are real. I would say that if anyone doesn't know, I care about this place a lot. It has done a lot for me. Um, the union and everything around it. And what I really want to see it do is do just that much for every single person that comes to this university. Um, if I win, that's what will motivate me this entire year. Um, and I'm really, really confident that I won't let you down on it. So that's what I'd like you to know. Thanks for speaking to us, Annie. No, thank uh, you. That was our interview with Annie Newman, who's signed to be Association President. Check out the rest of our interviews on the same website or our YouTube channel. How do you help to expand that portfolio? What ideas do you have to expand it? So first of all, so I've talked to um, RBS and Ben Stewart, who's head of, director of RBS, about this. Um, That's the residential business. Yes, services. yes, sorry. <laughs> um, and he he thinks that it's difficult, but it's a long term solution. So what you need to do, so obviously this is about having properties that are owned by landlords managed by the university. 